beloved community, this is the day that our God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Whether you are part of First Church, a joyful and justice-seeking church in the heart of our nation's capital, we welcome you to worship this morning. I want to offer a special welcome to Chandra Denap Wetstein. Chandra, if you would just raise your hand. Chandra will be our new intern from Wesley Theological Seminary. I also want to offer a welcome to her family, her husband BJ, their children Franklin, Stellan, and Troy, as well as her mother joining us today. They will be with us throughout the academic year. You will have the chance to see and hear from Chandra regularly. And just a note, uh, Chandra's name is sometimes mispronounced. So the <laughs> CH part sounds like a ch, and the A part sounds like an A. <laughs> so I, I'm going to invite you to just practice it with me one time. Chandra. Chandra. Great. Wonderful. Her bio is in your worship folder, so please do take the time to learn more about her. We are so grateful, Chandra, that God has brought you into our midst. As we continue our summer theme, sowing the seeds, today may we sow seeds of courage. In this hour of worship, may we water green tendrils with until our reverence ripens. Here in this place, I invite you to cultivate a courageous heart and get rooted in God's love. Following worship, all are invited to join us in the narthex for coffee hour. And then at noon, join Kim Darling and me upstairs in the chapel for a hybrid discussion of our summer read, Sisters in the Wilderness. All are invited, even if you did not read the book. <laughs> Friends, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome into the shared experience of worshiping the God whose love knows no bounds. So let us cross the threshold into sacred time, beginning with our opening hymn. Please rise in body or in spirit.
morning, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about change and courage. Powerful, powerful concepts. But first, I'm going to back up a little bit, and I'm going to start with a full disclosure. So I, I sit on the Worship Commission, and I actually helped choose this topic, you know, sowing the seeds of change. It was the summer topic. And it was on my mind, and, and I had been thinking about it a lot, you know, with work going on and everything happening in the country. I just thought this was a great topic. So when Amanda sent the email, and she said, would you like to speak on it? I, I was primed. Oh my gosh, I was so happy. And then she said, we're going to add courage as a twist. And I thought this was a gift. I thought this was just a gift from God. Until I actually read through my first draft. It was a little bit like a drunken sailor swaying back and forth between cliches and trite concepts. So bear with me. So I, we, all have the power to change. We have the power to inspire others to change, to be the change we want to see. And here's where you start counting the cliches. So change, for me, starts with a decision. It starts with an act. It starts with a moment of bravery. But it doesn't always require heroic courage. You're not running into a burning building to save a baby, even though you're scared of fire. Sometimes it's smiling at a stranger, and they feel welcomed. However, sometimes it does require that, oh my god, heart in your throat, pulse pounding, first word, first step, where you're having an outer body experience, and that rational hind part of your brain is screaming, oh my God, what are you doing? Stop. So why do we do it? Change happens when we are discomforted enough to act in our own lives or we see it as empathy in someone else's life. It may be that we are stepping up in a public place to stop harassment or bullying. It may be going out and marching for justice in the rain. It may be just the simple act of living an everyday life in a body that you alone have defined. Change needs courage. Why? I'll tell you why. Some of the most courageous people I have ever known will never make the news. They will never be lauded as heroes. But they show up every day in difficult circumstances. It may be against mental health. It may be poverty or living on the outside looking in. Odds that would stagger most of us. And yet, they show up every day. They have the courage of constancy. And they weave through our lives being present every day. They teach us what change, what courage looks like. That daily decision they make to be discomforted, to act. Thank you. Good morning, church. My name is Chandra Denap wetstein and thank you so much for that beautiful welcome, and thank you, Reverend Amanda, for allowing me to join this year with you. I'm so looking forward to it. Please join me in our prayer of confession for this morning. In this moment of worship, we call to mind those times of failure and regret common to all of us. We remember first in silence those times when we have failed to do all that we meant to do, or through our actions failed to be all that we are called to be. We now recall our moments of integrity those times we have lived into our deepest values and acted as the people God created us to be.
Together, let us pray. Forgiving God, today we lay down the burden of our shortcomings and grasp the courage to begin anew. Together, we affirm our capacity for goodness and grace, for liberation and joy. Thank you that in your freedom, we can live and grow. Thanks be to you, we are forgiven. Amen. God's peace. Peace be with you. And also with you. Peace, Robin Leonard. Hi. Peace. We can't unmute ourselves. Good morning. One, two, three. Are we on? I, you can hear me through the microphone. Okay, good. <clears throat> I am of weak voice. So, <clears throat> uh, When uh, I gave the title to Amanda on this, I, I really should have included the subtitle, <clears throat> which is for Bertie. Um, Bertie was my mother-in-law, Carol's, my wife's Carol's mom. And uh, this tune first came to me years ago when she was uh, started uh, living at her uh, care facility, and she was there for 11 years as her dementia gra gradually worsened and worsened. And uh, we would visit, and uh, Carol would play hymns, and she would sing along. And I'd often noodle on the piano or, or, or play my standards or whatever, <coughs> and that was very important to her. And so uh, she passed away two years ago. And uh, I played this tune as a instrumental, and it was called uh, For Birdie at Morningside. Uh, but a few weeks before I was going to play it, I, I was after I, I'm a piano tuner. After I finished my tuning, 
I played it because th this client liked to hear me play a little bit. And she was a choir director. And uh, she came up to me and said, oh, that's beautiful. She said, there should be words with it. And I said, hmm, well, does anything come to mind? And she said, well, I was hearing Jesus come to me. And I thanked her, and I walked out, and I thought, me write a song, Jesus come to me. That's, I had never written anything like that before. But driving home, I had one of those experiences where the words just started flowing to me. And I'm um, driving along the Shenandoah Valley country road, so it wasn't all that unsafe. But left hand on the wheel and right hand writing lyrics down in my... <laughs> down in my appointment book, and by the time I got home, it had written itself. And um, at first I didn't know what to make of that, but it later occurred to me that I really was writing, thinking about my mother-in-law and her uh, heroic struggle and her Christian faith that really kept her strong uh, through her decline. So, um, for Verdi, and this beautiful Robin on the trombone. Jesus, come to me, I will sing your praises. Jesus, come to me, let me know the way. Keep me by your side so I'll always hear you. In my heart I know you will always stay. Jesus, be with me, I will share your blessings. Jesus, be with me, show me right from wrong. Keep me by your side, I will not be fearful. In my heart I know you will keep me strong. Jesus, stay with me now and never leave me. Jesus, stay with me wherever I may roam. Keep me by your side and forever hold me. In my heart I know I am not alone. In my heart I know I am coming home. Please join me in a responsive reading from the Psalms. This is from Psalm 121. I raise my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? Our help comes from El Shaddai, mother of heaven and earth. She is the mighty God of the mountains. She will not let your feet slip along the journey. She will watch and keep you with an unsleeping eye. She who watches her children never slumbers. El Shaddai is your shelter and shade. We have nothing to fear in the brightness of the sun. We have nothing to fear in the glow of the moon. El Shaddai will preserve your soul and protect your life. She will be with us in our coming in and are going out, now and forever. Amen.
scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of John. Early in the morning, Jesus came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And making her stand before all of them, they said, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. Now, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They said this to test him, so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let anyone among you who is without sin cast the first stone. And once again, he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left all alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go on your way, and from now on, do not sin again. Word of the Lord. Will you pray with me? Search us, O oh God, and know our hearts. See if there is any destructive way in us and lead us in the everlasting way of love, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. As a child, I once jumped out of a treehouse to impress the older kids. I remember the euphoria of the takeoff, the sharp pain of the landing. When I was 16, I performed my most difficult skill on the balance beam, a no-handed backflip. I remember the singular second that preceded it each leg slicing through the air, the precision of the first foot landing. When I was 18, I bungee jumped off a crane. I'd never free fallen for so long. I remember the tug of the cord signaling I'd done it. I'd made the jump. When I was 21, I helped evacuate Hondurans living on a steep slope in a shanty town as Hurricane Mitch raged around us. I remember the mud and the rain and the grief. When I was 27, Seth and I signed on the dotted line to purchase our first home, a shotgun-style mini house that 
unbeknownst to us, was infested with termites. I remember wanting to just bulldoze the whole thing, but with no money to start over, we spent our engagement rebuilding it from the inside out. I remember standing before friends and family on a hot August afternoon, making our vows, having no earthly idea what we were getting into, but diving in all the same. When I was 30, I labored to bring Miles into the world, and I remember the terrifying question lodged in my throat during the train wreck of contractions. Will I survive this? A year and a half later, I sat with my dad as he labored to make his way out of this world. I remember my promise to stay by his side through the long hours. The following spring, a colleague and I launched a new church start. I remember the candles dancing, the shafts of light pouring in through the windows. I share this not to highlight acts of courage. I've never actually considered myself to be a risk taker. I share these anecdotes because they were the times I was most afraid, but I stepped forward anyway. And they are some of the most exquisite, grace-filled moments of my life. As we learn in today's text, the way of Jesus is no walk in the park. It is full of catastrophe and bewilderment and strife. But the only mistake to be made is failing to follow it. Annie Dillard observes, it is madness to wear velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews. How is it then that the church has become synonymous with rigid rules and anemic conformity? Our text for this morning sometimes appears bracketed in the Bible as scholars generally agree it was not originally part of John's gospel. They also tend to believe, according to Francis Taylor Gensch, that it has all the earmarks of an authentic incident from Jesus' life. Why then, she asks, did it become a free-floating story without a scriptural home? In all likelihood, because it was suppressed. The ease with which Jesus extended mercy to an adulterous woman embarrassed the earliest Christian communities and undermined their own severe practices. Sometimes the Bible can get out of hand. It's truth too searing, it's freedom too dangerous, particularly when it comes to the teachings of Jesus. Here we find some troublesome questions about the context of this story. Where, for instance, is the man with whom she was caught in the act? Why is she not asked her side of the story? Where are the witnesses on whose testimony her life rests for the penalty for adultery was death? Perhaps she was entrapped if her partner in crime was allowed to vanish so suddenly, or maybe he was a Roman soldier and the limits of Israel's law could not be imposed. Perhaps the encounter was not consensual, or maybe they were true lovers, but her husband would not consent to her request for divorce. There's so much we do not know about this story including what Jesus wrote in the sand. I am inclined to the view that he was spelling out the secrets of these corrupt men in the clear light of day for any witness to read. Part of their strategy to discredit Jesus was to stir up the people 
and nothing drew a crowd like a public stoning. I don't know if any of you have seen The Handmaid's Tale, but there's a stoning at the end of season one that is thwarted through an act of civil disobedience. In mere episodes, American women have gone from having jobs and sipping lattes they've purchased with their own money and marrying whomever they want to bank accounts frozen, mass layoffs, the swift takeover of a violent patriarchy remaking God in its own image. The thing you must know about a stoning is that it invites participation. Anyone within an arm's reach of a rock can take part, and this gruesome brutality performed under the cover of moral justification becomes a public purging of anger. The victim, a sacrificial lamb to quench the rage of an occupied people. When the religious authorities hauled this woman before Jesus, and recited the law that called for her stoning, they were playing to a crowd, activating a mob. Imagine it, the electric air, all eyes on Jesus, ready to move at his command. If he reached for a rock and cast the first, they would follow. But watch what Jesus does. He bends down, which, according to Patricia Joplin, breaks the spell of unanimity with his body. He refuses to stand with her accusers, but lowers himself to the ground. He begins to write in the dirt. He distracts. He offers a reprieve so a crowd closing in on hysteria can remember their humanity. Yet the authorities keep barraging him. The moment was shifting away from violence, away from misogyny, and they wanted to twist the attention back. But Jesus stood to give a verdict. Let anyone among you without sin cast the first stone. We've heard it so many times, we miss the scandal. Jesus did not say, let anyone who has never committed adultery cast the first stone. He did not say, anyone without sexual sin. He flattens all sin. All acts of human brokenness, any obstacle we've placed be between ourselves and God, any time we've failed to love our neighbor, the cumulative weight of our untruth, any cruel word we've said behind someone's back, that time we could have stepped in, but we didn't, we lacked the courage. Jesus places every solitary sin in one basket, and in so doing, restores us to equal footing with the accused. We have all sinned against God and one another. We have all given ourselves over to the bondage of broken relationships. We have not loved our families and our neighbors with our whole hearts. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. Now, I am not a Calvinist at heart, and total depravity is not a doctrine you've probably ever heard me preach about. And yet, my former professor, Dr. Roberta Bondi, claims it a virtue to see ourselves as sinners. It heals the wound of judgmentalism in our hearts. She notes that the monastic teachers were quite certain we cannot love others unless we understand at a deep level that our failures to love put us all in the same boat. To know ourselves. 
our shadow sides, the cold corners of the heart's catacomb to face the truth about our inability to love sometimes. I tell you, beloved community, it is the gateway into grace. I am no better than you, but see, I am no worse either. The capacity for love and the capacity for violence coexist in every heart. And I believe Jesus was preoccupied not with the sin of the accused woman, but with the crowd ready to stone her, with the religious authorities using her for their advantage. So he inquired. He challenges, he holds out the possibility of a change in heart. And do you know, they take it. They allow their hearts to be disarmed. One by one, the mob disperses. And the true scandal is the grace Jesus offers even to hypocrites. It is a grace that breaks religious law, transcends moral rigidity, disarms mob mentality. It is a grace that says to this woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She speaks for the first time. No one, sir. Neither do I. Go on your way. One could argue such grace does not transform unjust systems. This woman could be entrapped on another day, and where would Jesus be? He could not stop every stoning. Such grace is like casting a single starfish back into the sea. What difference does it make? that interpretation is lacking. For what Jesus was always about, from the first day he stepped onto the public stage, was building the kingdom of God, the beloved community. And he built this alternate reality, this heaven on earth, everywhere he went. In each interaction, he revealed a different way to be in community, a new path, the everlasting way of love. He cast seed with abandon on the soil of every kind of heart, grace upon grace. Mercies new each morning, bread in the wilderness. It takes courage to live this way. Theologian Stanley Saunders gets to the heart of the matter when he notes, faithful practice of the gospel inevitably puts disciples on a collision course with the powers of this world. And perhaps that's the warning sign, the disclaimer that we ought to print in the worship folder every Sunday, following Jesus is not an exercise in frivolity. We are headed straight toward a collision with the powers of hatred and violence, ego and greed. Yet Jesus said, do not fear. And God assures us, when you walk through the waters, I will be with you and the waves will not overcome you. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. So grab your crash helmets, beloved community, and buckle up. We will trade cleverness for bewilderment. We will stomp our feet with the power of the gospel and watch old walls crumble. We will join the laughter that emanates from the margins and the domesticated church will curl up like burnt paper. We will walk with courage, for we belong to God. Amen.
We've come to that time in our service where we invite you to give of your tithes and offerings to support the ministries of this church and the shared mission to which we are called. Um, the easiest ways to give, if you are here in the sanctuary, there is an offering plate on your way out along with a QR code. For those who are joining us by Zoom, Barry will put a link in the chat to take you to our donate page where you can give via Vanco or PayPal. You can always send a check into the mail as well. During this time of the service, I often like to lift up a ministry that is so worthy of your giving. And this morning, I just want to remind you that we have a very exciting fall ahead of us. On September 8th, we will have our homecoming Sunday where we hope that folks who we have seen every now and then over summer will all stream back through our doors and we will have the opportunity to be in fellowship together. Our outreach and membership ministry has been um, very focused on helping to remind us the importance of being an invitational church. And what that means is that September 8th, our homecoming Sunday, when our children's Sunday school will reconvene under the leadership of Reverend Sam, when our choir will regather under the direction of our designated uh, uh, musician Dennis Turner, and when we will celebrate our first potluck of the fall, that the theme for that potluck is a taste of home, what that means is that we invite you now to think about who you will invite through our doors on September 8th. Maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a friend or a colleague, maybe it's just your own weary soul, but we want to not keep the secret of this place a secret. We want the word to get out that if this is a community of faith that means something to you, that has ministered to you in your life in any way, surely, surely there is someone God is placing on your path who might welcome an invitation. So I, I give thanks for our outreach and membership ministry. Karen Byrne is our, our wonderful, fearless chairperson, and I thank you for your generous hearts as you give to support our shared ministry here. I invite you now to rise as we give thanks to God from whom all blessings come. Please join me in the doxology. As we turn now to a time of prayer, I would invite you to share any joys or concerns that you would like to share with this community of people. And if I could invite Moira Jones to take around the, the microphone. Moira chairs our worship commission. Just raise your hand and she will bring the microphone to you. For a prayer, a prayer of gratitude for the United Church Funds, which provides investment management services to UCC congregations and related church organizations. Um, United Church Funds is a part of a global coalition called Climate Action 100, which calls on corporations to um, combat global warming by making changes in their operations. And recently, the House Judiciary Committee sent letters to members of the Climate Action 100, uh, Climate Action 100, 
accusing them of being engaged in illegal collusion. And the United Church Fund sent a letter back to um, uh, Jim Jordan, chair of the House Judiciary Committee, this week saying, this is what we are called by God to do to respond to the climate crisis. So, words of gratitude. Prayers for my 94-year-old um, mom, Joanne Marsh, who is um, at home. We live together, but she's getting a lot weaker, and um, I just pray for her comfort and, and her joy in these last years. Thanks. Um, I'd like a prayer for my sister, her um, husband, and my nephew. She is expecting uh, a baby any day now, so prayers for a safe delivery and for their family. Um, and then also prayers for anyone who are s who's struggling with infertility or longing to be a parent, um, that God blesses them in this time as well. I'd like to hold the Reverend Jason Thompson. He was uh, the, he did his internship at Bethel while we were there. Um, and he is an ordinand of Little River. Three weeks ago, he lost his beloved husband to suicide. Um, and it's, he's been struggling really hard with a lot of it and has a, their friends. So I would just like to hold Jason. I'd like to ask your prayers of support for our grandson, Sam, who is beginning his freshman year at University of Mary Washington tomorrow. Yeah, college students who are headed back shortly. I just want to offer a prayer of comfort and support for our good friends, um, Mari Castellanos and um, Diana Damelina Gomez, um, as they um, navigate um, the increasing challenges of um, Mari's uh, memory loss and um, went to visit them a couple weeks ago and um, um, prayers of support and strength for them. And I, I know that they would appreciate um, outreach from their church family. I know Mari and Diana are constantly in our prayers, and so I would encourage anyone who feels um, pulled to, to visit them or to support them in any way, please do speak to Sandy or speak to me. I just wanted to ask for prayers for my friend Matthew, whose mother was diagnosed with cancer, um, and he's been taking care of her just for him. Thank you, Michael. We will pray for them. I want to thank all of you for your wonderful support. As Dale has gone into Brighton Gardens, he's doing well. And um, I, it really, it's through your support that, that I'm also doing well. I want to ask for prayers for the Secret Service. They are our neighbors right across the alley. And they are struggling with trying to figure out their error, terrible error. But every day, they are protecting so many people. Yeah. It's such hard work, and it's so terrifying in these times. True. And I offer a prayer for them. Thank you, Mag. Good morning. It's a prayer of gratitude for time we were able to spend with our daughter, Abby and her beloved Nick, um, and we are less than three weeks away from celebrating their marriage. We cannot wait. <laughs> As part of the Wetstein family, I would thank everyone for their welcome and ask prayers with enthusiasm, tolerance, and grace mm. for all of us. Absolutely. For Kendra. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to offer two uh, prayer requests. One is for um, a 
Thanksgiving for my Uncle Larry, who is uh, 95 and a half this month, and he's still going strong. And the second prayer is for my friend Carol, who was uh, struck and killed uh, by an automobile um, a couple of days ago on her morning walk, and also ask for prayers of comfort for her partner, Ralph. Mm. Thank you, Rob. I have a few others that have come into me that I would like to lift up. One, um, perhaps you notice how gorgeous our sanctuary floors look today. Or maybe you don't notice, but I would call your attention to how gorgeous our sanctuary floors look today. Um, Inez, who is our custodian here, uh, takes the opportunity in the summer to deep clean, and she worked her heart out to make these floors look the way that they do this morning. So I give thanks for Inez for the ways that she is constantly laboring behind the scenes with her whole heart um, to make this church be so beautiful for all of us. Uh, I am truly grateful. Abby Johnson asks for prayers for her aunt and her cousin, Margaret and Bobby Cunningham, who lost their sister-in-law and aunt, Dr. Lena Cunningham, last week after losing Abby's uncle Bobby, which all of you will remember from a few months ago. And we also lift up her great aunt, Dorothy Bradley, who was recently diagnosed with cancer. We are, we are praying for your family and holding you close in this time. I also want to lift up um, a colleague, the Reverend Timoth Sylvia, whose husband died unexpectedly this week, um, leaving him and their three incredible adopted children behind who, who live with special needs. Prayers for Reverend Timoth. Prayers of mercy for the people of Sudan as they face famine and a growing risk of genocide. Prayers of safety for the people of Ukraine, particularly those living near the nuclear plant where safety is deteriorating uh, due to this ongoing war. Will you pray with me? Loving God in these days when children are returning to school and the wheel of the season prepares to turn, we thank you for the strength of a faith that reminds us that we belong to you. Renew our minds that we may not conform ourselves to the world, but be transformed. We praise you for the beauty of your world and the wonder of a new day. We thank you especially for this sanctuary, a place where our hearts find belonging as we encounter the courage of Jesus to love more deeply. Today, we lift up to you the names and hearts and situations, spoken and unspoken, that we release into your eternal hands. For all who are sick or facing death, for the ones who weep, for those in places where famine is taking hold, we ask that your grace would alight in their hearts and that they would have bread sufficient for another day for a just peace among the nations and within nations. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our own country, facing a momentous election, we pray that each of us would help strengthen our shared democracy. For all recovering from destructive storms, may they know your presence. Comfort, comfort the afflicted, Bless the dying, inspire the despairing, lift up our hearts to you, O oh God, as we now pray together the prayer Jesus taught the disciples. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Amen. Friends, please rise in body or in spirit for our closing hymn, Oh for a World, that's number 575. Before our final blessing, I want to remind you to check our newsletter website and social media pages for announcements. If you are a new guest worshiping with us today who would like to stay connected to the life of our church, Nick is holding up our blue visitor cards at the back. Please do fill one out. And if you are a newcomer joining us on Zoom, the link to the digital visitor's card can be found in your worship folder. Please do fill it out so we can stay connected with you. Uh, please do join us after worship in the narthex for coffee hour and then at noon join Kim Darling and me upstairs in the chapel for a hybrid discussion of our congregational summer read Sisters in the Wilderness by Dolores Williams. As a reminder you do not have to have read the book and we will use the same Zoom link as for worship. Next Sunday as Reverend Sam mentioned earlier, we invite our children to bring their backpacks for a blessing of the backpacks with Reverend Sam. Uh, I will be away presiding over the nuptials of Abigail and Michael. Please pray for them. Um, so Reverend Laura Simmons will serve as our preacher. We will enjoy special music from Casey Capsambellis. You don't want to miss it. I want to thank all who made today's service possible. Uh, Amelia Anderson, who at the very last hour stepped in as our AV tech. Thank you so much, Amelia. Uh, Barry Mills, our Zoom moderator. Moira Jones, who set our worship table. Our liturgists, Ellen Bushmiller and Chandra Denap wettstein And our scripture reader, Peter Byrne our guest musician Rob Passau, and our beautiful guest music or special musicians um, who just break my heart open every time, the Olsen brothers. Thank you so much. And finally, um, our usher team, uh, Nick and Nan McConnell, I, it looks like Ellen may be assisting back there as well, and our Coffee Hour host, Anissa Hemming, and her family with the help of Jamie Moore. Now for our final blessing. Beloved community, go from God's sanctuary to reap the harvest of love. 
go from this place to sow seeds of justice and courage, go from this community of God's people to be the hands and feet of Christ to the world. And may God bless you and keep you as you go. Amen. Thank you.